So you know the joke, what is two plus two, right? So the engineer says two plus two is 4.000. And the geologist says two plus two is, well, it's not exactly three, it's not exactly five. You know, it's, that's the range of likely values. And the geophysicist says, what do you want it to be? Hey guys, you are listening to the Crude Audacity podcast, the podcast that talks shop shit and all things strategy with oil patch influencers. I am Catherine Mills. So today, before we jump into our topic, if you could go ahead and hit that subscribe button down in the corner there for me, that way you can stay up to date with all things Crude Audacity and of course, all things oil field. Today, you are tuned into the Petroleum Underground segment. Now, this is our segment where we address all conversations from the boardroom to the pump route that make you stop and say, what the? Yeah, we aren't afraid of the unapologetic or hard conversations that happen across the patch. So here we will be addressing them all. Tonight's topic, Petroleum, Petroleum Underground, underground take over night. night. Yeah. I'm sorry uh, I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> okay. Catherine, um, thanks for having us. This is exciting. We are honored to do the takeover. I am Kat Campbell, um, team geologist. I'm a geologist at Camino Natural Resources. And my name's Deb Ryan, and I'm team reservoir engineering. I'm the senior manager of reservoir engineering at Sproul, managing our Denver office. And we're just going to jump right in. So when we talk about diversity in the oil and gas industry, we automatically think of race, gender, age, physical capability, all of those things. This represents identity diversity. But what about cognitive diversity? The ability for people to think differently and approach problems from different angles. This cognitive diversity is no more apparent in the oil and gas industry than it is between our geologists and our petroleum engineers. As we all muddle along together, or sometimes separately, trying to figure out the complexity of the subsurface. So tonight, we're really excited to have both Matt Silverman and Rhonda Gathers joining, joining us for Takeover Night. Um, I'm going to let Matt and Rhonda both introduce themselves. And some of it as part of uh, what we're actually interested in, we're actually really curious as well, not to just learn about your technical backgrounds and why we've invited you guys along today. But when, you, when people ask you, what you do and you respond with, well, I'm a geologist or I'm an engineer. We're also really curious about how do they respond to that? So Matt, do you want to take us away and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm the exploration manager for a little independent based in Denver, Robert L. Bayless producer. I've been doing this for about 45 years. Uh, I'm a geologist. I've worked for companies as big as Total, which was at the time the fourth largest publicly traded company in the world, uh, oil company in the world, and as small as uh, putting together prospects uh, in my own study here at home. Um, I've, I've, I've had a lucky career. I've been able to work all over the world. I've worked in 40 different countries, uh, and that's been a real joy. Um, the answer to your question about what I tell people what I do, and they may not understand exactly what it is, I say, well, we're the people who keep the lights on and keep uh, gas uh, in your gas tank. Very cool. And Rhonda? One other note, Matt was my boss for like six or seven years, something like that. Just Six beautiful that in there. years. I was going to say, but that's okay. It obviously worked <laughs> out well. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Rhonda. I work for a small operator called Rampart Energy Company. Right now we are active in Nebraska, as well as in North Dakota. Um, I'm in my 25th year working in oil and gas as a petroleum engineer. Um, at Rampart Energy, I am the vice president of our engineering department and our operations department. I, I've done everything from field production, field operations, project management, reservoir engineering, economics, reserves, field studies with simulation, a lot of the domestic basins, uh, <laughs> unconventional and conventional. Some of my international stuff included Bahrain, China, Poland, and in Canada. So I've worked in a lot of teams over the years. Uh, yeah. and Including one with me, which was yeah. awesome. <laughs> 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 and um, as far as when people ask me what I do, 
I've had my, my children ask me what I do as well. And I try to just kind of simplify it as best I can that I, I look at oil and gas reservoirs underground. I determine how much it's going to cost to get it out. How do we get it out? Where is it at? Yeah, how we, how we produce it at the surface as well. So. Yeah. Really cool. Well, we're so excited that you're both here to join Cat and I today, both on Team Geo and Team, team Engineering. So, yeah, thanks for both for being here. Pleasure. Um, thinking about that, that question of um, how do people respond when you say what you do, my husband's an engineer. And so when we introduce ourselves, I say, oh, I'm a geologist and he's an engineer. And people are like, geologist, so what, what do you do? And then <laughs> when they hear he's an engineer, they're like, oh, cool, yeah, engineering. So you're really smart and you, you fix things. And geology, what do you, do you just go look at rocks? Like what, what exactly do you do? So that's one of those stereotypes that we want to try to work on this evening. So that brings us into the next topic, which are the key traits of a geologist versus an engineer. Uh, and along those lines, what makes you tick? So from a geology perspective, we see engineers as working within constraints, whereas geologists tend to be more theoretical, asking fundamental questions and having a desire to understand the phenomena that we see at a much deeper level. Whereas engineers have a set of constraints that they follow, a lot of processes to come to a definite answer. Whereas geology is more of, you know, there's probably a storm there 543 million years ago, and that's why that is there. So can you guys talk about your thoughts on that, what you see as the key traits of these two disciplines and why they're so different, or are they? Sure. I'll Take it away, here. whoever wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, as far as, you know, when I sit down and think about this and the things I've seen over the years, engineers are very, they want to optimize the process as much as we can. So, <laughs> you know, we're, we want those solutions and we're, we're data driven and we're research driven as well. You know, I had, I had a professor once in school tell me, and it's, it's to a T, that the thing about engineers is that if we want this to happen, what do we do to make it happen? And then when you come to the geologists, which are more of the scientist side, their question is, if we do this, what will happen? So that's always kind of stuck with me over the years. But the way I see geologists is that they're kind of, they're, they're curious side of the industry. They're the storytellers and the scientists. They, they, they have more imagination than the engineers do. Um, I like the term imagination, Rhonda. One of the things that I've often told people is that I love geology because it's uh, rigorous enough to be challenging, but there's enough art in it that we need to be creative. Mm. And that combination of left brain, right brain, or uh, art and uh, science is very appealing. That's really cool, guys. I really love it. Um, and. I've worked for like a number of different companies where sometimes we've got all the, the subsurface teams working together on projects, but then when we need maybe support from say finance and stuff, you've got to go outside it. And I've also worked for companies where the engineers sit on one floor and the geologists sit on another floor and we don't talk to each other. So what are your thoughts in terms of what you guys have seen over the course of your career in terms of what works well in terms of organizing companies and does it matter big, small, that kind of stuff? Like, what are you guys' thoughts about that? I haven't um, worked for a big company with a lot of floors in a long time. <laughs> we've, got, we've got two sides. You know, we put the geos on one side and the engines on the other. We've only got one floor too, but yeah. <laughs> but I still think there's no substitute for being able to walk down the hall and talk to your landman or talk to your engineer or talk to your boss. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, Matt has a good point. Um, and I also, well, I've never worked for a larger company. The companies that I've worked for have always been less than 100 people. So I don't have that experience with the larger companies, but we still had, you know, an expansive floor. You know, early on when I started, we didn't have email. We didn't have internet access. We, our teams were set up to where we were all located together on, on the floor, but near by each other. So um, it was more effective to be able to get up and go down the hall and ask a question to the geologist <clears throat> or the, uh, the operations engineer and, and say, hey, you know, I'm seeing this, what's going on, what do you think? 
Um, nowadays, uh, email is a big tool, but it's also time consuming, I think, as well. And you can't, I don't think you can communicate as well over email because there's a lot of things that could be assumed or um, not explained very well. But face to face is, is, a, is a huge thing for me also. So given the face to face, one more piece, at the moment we're all working remotely and working from home. Like how do you think that impacts your teams and, and working together with the engines and the geos where it is often sharing maps and data and sitting around a table together? Have you seen any impacts of that? I think right now people are being very patient about that. I don't think that patience yeah. is likely to last forever. <laughs> No, that's that's a really good point. So yeah, there's a lot of back and forth with the email. I've been trying to get my team to use Microsoft Teams so that we can chat instead of sending texts or emails because that can tend to get uh, there. There could be a lot of emails that are built up when you're just having some questions about what's going on or, or what have you. Not very effective to me. Do you guys see a difference in how engineers versus geologists communicate, either through email or uh, in general? Geologists are very much more laid back with their communication. <laughs> That's what I've seen from experience. Whereas the engineers are, you know, are like, we got, we got to, we got to get this down. We got to get it down, you know, now. Engineers need to have the patience to listen to the geologists. I think they need, to, we, have, we need to understand how they think and vice versa. That's a challenge in person, but it's really a challenge by email because in email, it's hard to get the tone right of what you want to say. Yeah, I've been trying sense. to communicate exclusively through memes. <laughs> they are very effective, I've noticed. I think Especially. all of you have gotten those. <laughs> I think we may have the two engineers here on this call with the best sense of humor of all engineers. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't true. think of that as their first trait. <laughs> There's, there's some engineers out there that definitely don't have senses of humor. I've, I've definitely met a few in my time. So <laughs> Yeah. When you find a macro humorous, there's something lacking. Along those lines of working together and working on projects, how about the initiation of a project? Uh, how does the mindset of a geologist versus an engineer influence where a project goes? If one starts it versus another, and how does this vary by situation for operated, non-op, consultants versus operators, and then also taking into account company size? Matt, you can probably speak to that a little bit more. So just that, that initiation of a project and then where it goes from that initiation based on who starts it. Well, I think if you look at management, it's mostly accountants and engineers. And that means it's mostly white male accountants and engineers in this business. Um, when... Uh, when a project is brought to the table by geologists, I think the first reaction of the engineers and accountants is, this is ridiculous. Sorry, this is too expensive. This will, this will <laughs> never work. Didn't you ever take a physics class? That kind of thing. Um, but it's our job as geologists to say, um, we've we got to be open to what the unlikely. If we're going to find a big field or develop a new play or open a new basin. We had to do something that you didn't read about when you went to the Colorado School of Mines 30 years ago. Do you think it, do you think then generally, Matt, engineers are more pessimistic and geologists are more optimistic? Would you say that generally? Or you've seen both? Yeah, so yeah, generalizations are always wrong, including this one. <laughs> but I think engineers are better at counting. I mean, a lot of us, <laughs> would have been engineers if we could count better. So oh, they, look at, they look at the numbers and they say, well, um, your idea is a good one, except for the fact that all of your assumptions are false. Well, there's also the piece that we have that creative component where we can drill a dry hole and say it was a stratigraphic test. It's all how you kind of swing sure. it. It wasn't a million dollars loss. It's a game. Yeah, we learned something. Logged. We can map it. Rhonda, what do you think from what you've seen? I think in general... Yes, geologists are more optimistic than engineers. I think that's a wide generalization, but that's not always true. But I think the majority of the time it could be. Well, I wonder as well, like having worked in consulting, Rhonda, I know you've done some time in consulting as well. Do you think that varies, again, between people that are consultants, whether they're engineers or geos, 
versus those that work for an operator? Uh, yes and no. You know, as you work as a consultant, you can't give the operator the, or your client the, I guess, the, 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 the over-evaluation of it, that high side, because they, st they tend to get stars in their eyes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would I would say <laughs> that the environment, yeah, definitely the culture and the environment that you're in is highly dependent on how optimistic or pessimistic you can be. Yeah, engineers don't want you to come to them with uh, bad news, <laughs> but you don't want to overpromise because that'll just come right back at you. Sometimes it's bigger and better than you possibly imagined, but not very often. How about within the process? Uh, do you feel like one side, either geologists or engineers can sidetrack faster, creating new methodologies and potentially digging deeper into the understanding of a, of a problem. I feel like engineers can't be quite as nimble because of the equations and the protocol that always results in the solution, whereas geologists have to take into account every possible thing, put their, their nose as well tongue on the rock and to truly see it and try to understand the, what's going on there. And I feel like geologists also need to be cut off. You have to say, I need a 60% solution. I need an 80% solution. Stop mapping and just give me a number. So how do those, once the process is initiated, as it's going down the road, how does that process work on a geologist versus an engineer side? Yeah, I, I think the engineers tend to, to, to put blinders on so they, they know what their, you know, what their process is and what their end result is so that it's, it is harder for them to switch gears easier. Um, but I do appreciate the, you know, and that's, this comes down to some diverse thought processes that engineers aren't always going to see or know what the geologist sees and knows and integrating all of that. You know, if we're not communicating and we're not communicating effectively, which is also a big deal, at least for, for me, from my experience for, with engineers, that um, it is harder to switch gears and it, you kind of bury yourself in like, hey, no, I know this is what we need to do and this is how we're going to do it. But yeah, geologists are much more flexible when it comes to that, but we need to listen to them as well. I think it's our job as geologists to explain to the engineers and the finance people and the decision makers very clearly and succinctly what it is that makes us excited about a new project or a new well without getting into why we fell in love with geology. I think we fall into that trap too often. And I think it's their job as engineers to be open to something new and that they hadn't thought about before and to ask us hard questions and to try to understand what is it that you read last week in uh, a new uh, scientific publication that makes you think this is going to work now when it never worked before? To that point, do you think, I mean, there's so much out there in the literature now with technical papers and books and stuff <laughs> like that, that we even, even beyond geologists and engineers, we've started to even to like put subgroupings within that, you know, do you think it becomes even harder for us to look beyond some of our micro disciplines and also have management and understand all those nuances because there's so much content out there? No, I think the access to the content has just helped more than anything and, and, and having it there to be able to document and uh, refer to um, helps with the process and helps to explain to management, you know, hey, this study has been done or people have tried this before, you know, we didn't have access to a lot of that. Having all that content isn't just a challenge, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to take advantage of that gift and if you're not eager to take advantage of that gift, then maybe you ought to retire. I we're appreciate gonna, you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to segue here just a tad. Uh, we're going to, so Kat and I want to play a little game now to talk about the diversity and sort of we've been talking around how engineers and geologists think very differently with how we, we look at things and view things and Geologists are all about the rocks and our spreadsheets. Our engineers love our spreadsheets and our chart. We've put together a couple of images here. We know that as engineers, we love our spreadsheets. We live and die by our spreadsheets and our charts. And as geologists, you guys live and die by the rocks. And so we've been talking a lot here about the cognitive diversity and how we think differently. 
So I'm going to let Kat talk through. We've got some interesting pictures, and I don't know what cats are, and she doesn't know what mine are either. So we're going to kind of talk through as a group and just kind of see what each other thinks of, of some interesting rocks and charts from the other discipline. This is the first one. Those are iron nodules. Is this? Is she right, Kat? Darn it. Yes. <laughs> Um, they're called Martian marbles. Uh, yeah. So Matt, do you, do you want to talk about the processes here? Is that in Utah? Yeah. That's awesome. I hadn't seen them before. It's really cool. <laughs> Not a um, good thing in your reservoir. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not a good thing with your electric log. No, I was going to say, I assume it messes with your logs pretty badly. Um, what's interesting about these is they were... Something similar was discovered on Mars by the NASA rover Opportunity in 2004. Um, they're thought to have formed in a similar way and might be evidence for water on Mars. Just a little. See, this is what geology is. It's so cool. Was, I it's applied everywhere. Really cool. Um, so these are spherical iron concretions, and they probably have some kind of um, something at the center that acts as a nucleating agent, and it allows the, um, the iron to just kind of form around it. So the iron can be several hundred million years or several tens of millions of years younger than the actual rock because it's forming once the rock is already formed. Matt, any comments? It looks like a skin condition. It does. It's not good. <laughs> Been watching Dr. Pimple Popper too much? <laughs> the barnacle. Sorry oh, that. God. Okay. Which stratigraphic <laughs> unit is that in? I think this one is Navajo. I looked at so many pictures of these. Could be. Let's, uh... Okay, next one. <laughs> what is this? Off. That's a sand, some sandstone outcrop. Is this from Arches? It's been molded by the wind. <laughs> so being water. really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you know what it is? It's kind of creepy looking. <laughs> It looks like a very unhappy face. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> Even a landman could make that comment. <laughs> that well, what I love that. is that, well, what I love about this is that Rondo went straight to, okay, this is a sandstone. It's showing these characters. And that's like, it's looking sad. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that, that just, we just captured a true example of geologists versus engineers. Um, this is a picture I took in the Grand Canyon on a rafting trip with geologists, which is a rite of passage as a geoscientist. This is a soft sediment deformation um, down in the canyon. And this guy just, he stuck with me. I love That's him. really cool. He's so sad. <laughs> All right. Bring it on, Deb. No. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what you got. got some, Do you have pictures of rock? Now. Oh, charts. Yeah. We've got charts. We're back to spreadsheets. Are they? So. Are they from Excel? Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't make them. I stole them off the internet. So <laughs> the ones that I was gonna make in Excel were gonna be too simple. They'd figure out what they were. Okay. So this is the first one. What do we think this is? A web of lies. Wow. It's a web. That's for sure. Oh, I don't know or something. It's a it's a stratigraphic. Um, Cat <laughs> Catherine's like I know I know. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna leave us here too long. So this is energy use and supply in Europe. So this is nice. Germany, Czech Republic, <laughs> the Danes, the French, wow. and it's. When you actually link to this data, if you click on Germany, it shows who, like, the orange is Germany out and where they send it, and mm -hmm. then France is the green out and where they send it and stuff like that. So, uh, and again, I've got a little link here. I can send it to you guys later, but it was put where out. Where they're like, sending energy or where they're getting it? Both. So here, you can see here, France is sending into Germany, and Germany yeah. sending out to, like, Denmark, to the Czechs wow. and stuff like that. So you can okay. track energy movement through Europe. So that was so, kind of a so, bizarre one, but it was the weirdest so energy. Why, why does Russia look so small when they export so much gas? Uh, it's just energy. So it's not uh, oil and gas. So it's like actual converted power generation, I think. So, oh, okay. yeah. So it was just a cool chart. So I thought it'd be fun. So it, that's a good one. That stumped me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice. And then I have a slightly easier one. So, 
what do we think this is? And let me. Vintage Doyle production? Yes. And what about it? The source of the oil? Uh, the rise of unconventionals? So this was a 1995, 1992, sorry, prediction of where we were going to be. So this is uh, oh, cool. 1970 that everybody thought was going to be the end of oil. And then we found Alaska and everything peaked back up in 1985. And once again, everybody thought that it was going to decline. And then this was an estimate for some tight and like deep Gulf of Mexico. And in 2020, it was predicted that the U.S. would be producing 6.5 or 6.7 million barrels a day of oil. So from a 1990 forecast. So I kind of liked this because it talks to, one, why engineers are often wrong, um, even though we don't like to admit it. And uh, two, like it's just, yeah, it's an interesting kind of history take on where we thought we were going to be versus where we are today. Don't you think we geologists are wrong more often? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't believe so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop the sharing and go back. Um, I, I feel like I'm fair, wrong a, all the time. I think it's a fair shakeout. Fair shakeout. Something we can agree on. We're all equally wrong <laughs> all the time. Yeah. So. You guys are just wrong by percentages. And we're just wrong-ish. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, good job with the charts. I was very impressed, Rhonda, that you picked the I, and I had no idea what that was. <laughs> so we've, we've talked a lot about the benefits of having diverse teams. I feel like when companies are talking about diversity, they feel like, I feel like if they just include women, that they're covering their bases. And we've talked a lot about the difference between cognitive diversity, and obviously we've got a mix of genders today and stuff like that. Like, do you feel that companies are doing the right thing in terms of diversity and not just identity diversity, but as well having people with different thoughts and ideas within our, our technical teams and our leadership teams. What do you guys think? I think it's a lot yeah. better than it used to be. That doesn't yeah. mean we're all, the, we're all the way there. Mm -mm. How I, think have we need to, I think we need to separate diversity from tokenism. Mm. How have you seen it change, Matt? So not that many years ago, we referred to people as lady lawyers or your gal geologist. Mm. You don't see that anymore. Which is nice. Um, I hope that's reflected in the seriousness with which decision makers take the input provided by female geologists, engineers, landmen, et cetera. I, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. It hasn't improved over time. Uh, definitely, I'm not the only woman sitting at the table now, like I used to be for quite a while. But there's still that lacking, I think, in in terms of identity diversity. There, there's you know, not a lot of uh, different skin colors at the table. You know, on the other hand, I think the culture is changing, and um, I have definitely seen in terms of the cognitive diversity uh, more people speaking up. Um, because everybody's thought process is different. Everybody has their own superpower. Um, managers' jobs are, are to identify that and, and put them forth in that superpower and um, empower them. But it, and I've seen that happening quite a bit. All of our, combine all of our superpowers, like Power Rangers back in the day. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Sorry. Some surface Power Rangers. <laughs> Oop, my puppy's <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think that problem is especially along... true for oil and gas companies. Sorry, Kat. Especially yeah. true for no, oil right? and gas companies because there are so few minorities in so-called technical and professional positions in oil and gas companies, even compared to other industries. So we don't see that diversity of opinion in our decision-making process. And I think in any decision nearly any decision-making process, diversity of points of view is an advantage. Along those lines, do you, <laughs> you think that, that uh, 
Do you think that the group specific um, societies are beneficial, like the um, the women's energy networks uh, that pull out women or the um, young professional groups, like it's important for those groups to exist and communicate, but are you just adding more attention to the fact that they are just, well, not that they're just women, but they are women or they are young? Um, that's something we've seen with AAPG, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, that by calling someone a young professional, you add this title that can be actually kind of harmful. So that's something we've been working on is do you, do you still pull it out like that? So are these women's groups doing the same thing or is it beneficial? What do you guys think? I think as far as the women's groups, it's been highly beneficial. Um, not something that I've seen, you know, through the years when I was coming up as a petroleum engineer, we never had that in place. And, and it seems within the last five years, we've had these women's groups come in and what it's doing is actually empowering and, and helping to educate the woman, women and empowering them that they have options. They have that ability to step up to the table and not shy away from, uh, you know, making statements in a meeting or asking for that position or striving for that position because in the past they didn't think that they had the, that opportunity to do so. So I think it, in that aspect, it's been beneficial for the women. I don't think that calling it out separately um, because we do have different needs and um, a different thought process it, it, and it helps to have that, that camaraderie and that, that networking. If I were a young professional, I'd want to be in a group like that. And I'd also want to be in a group with all the good old boys. Do, it, mm -hmm. do both of those or all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. And Definitely. do you think that's also the case? Kind of where, where I'm going with this is do you think that uh, geologists and engineers each have their societies? Should those societies come together? And this is something Deb and I have spent a lot of time discussing is how do you combine those societies? And that's something we'll talk about at the end as well. But along those lines, we're, we're so separated by all these things, and one of the biggest is what we do. So should we all come together? What's, what's the benefit? Does that exist? So I'll oh, answer that with a question. I'll an Kat, I'll answer that with a question. Does Ertech work? It does. I mean, I would jump in and say it does. The thing that Kat and I have been talking about is, despite the fact that we're both uh, doing a lot within our respective SPE and AAPG, we hadn't met until three or four months ago, which a lot of people were surprised about because we've been I'm so hyper-focused <laughs> on... I <AAPG>. blame Catherine. <laughs> uh, we've been so hyper-focused on our respective discipline societies. And so I think, yes, Ertech absolutely works and it's awesome. But in terms of some of the peer-to-peer -peer things like diversity and leadership and some of these other skills, I think there's a real opportunity for us to come together to have more of that peer relationship that we get with things like Women's Energy Network and other and Woger and some of the other networks that we don't see, I think, but Ertech's been a huge step in the right direction. I would agree, Matt. Does Ertech work on a technical basis, not just on a personal basis? Well, no, I was going to say, that's, I think on a technical yeah. basis, that's what I mean. I think that's been a huge, I think it's been a huge benefit to our societies. I'm going to admit, though, I don't go to the geo talks. I just go to the restaurant sharing talks. You're invited. Um, Matt, to your point, yeah, I mean, I think Ertech has done a, a huge, it's been hugely beneficial bringing the engineers right. and the geologists and the geophysicists together, uh, and every now and then, you know, petrophysicists for good measure, into the same room to have some of these technical <laughs> discussions. Um, I really do. I just, I think there is a huge opportunity for us to continue that and particularly at a local level because Ertech has such a huge presence now. It just kind of rolls in. It rolled into Denver last year and rolled out again. And, and a lot of people weren't as, you know, I knew people that wanted to be involved and stuff like that. And so some of it, even then in our diverse teams, don't, we don't necessarily then interact and talk to each other as much as we maybe could. And you know, on that, I'm really curious with what you guys have seen over the course of your careers of how have we changed our teams? How have, how have we seen our technical teams evolve and change over time? And, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And Just to jump in here, the teams I don't think have changed too much over time. I mean, we've had, we, we have now added a petrophysicist into a team, say now, where we didn't have that in the past. 
<laughs> but um, in general, I think the teams, the, the way that they have uh, been built are pretty similar. But what I'm seeing now is there's more, there's more presentation of, you know, when you're working on a project and you have all four, say you have the, um, you know, for example, a team that I used to work on, we had, you know, the production engineer, the reservoir engineer, we had a geologist, we had a petrophysicist, we had a geophysicist. And on all of that, that aspect of that team coming together on a weekly basis, we would, you know, we would present our data every week. And it was amazing to see who could pull something in from, you know, say my production slides, who saw something that I would have never seen uh, and, and the amazing amount of work that we were able to get done and problems that we were solving uh, on a weekly basis was pretty amazing. And I think like, with, you know, with the societies coming together, the thing that we don't understand is like you said, how each other works and what they're doing. Uh, so that cross uh, collaboration with societies, I think is, is important because our teams are built of all of those people. Yeah, I mean, everything that Rhonda said is right. Um, I think you have the basic conflict between the uh, engineer who wants a, uh, a one-line answer to your question and the geologist who wants to draw a curved line based on one point. That's never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I did that in a presentation once, and no one called me out on it. I just wanted to say that. So. It may happen. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that we've forgotten is the difference between geologists and engineers when you go on location. Mm. So you're on a location right. and the, the engineers all show up in their hard hats and their steel-toed boots in their pickup trucks. And the geologists show up in their t-shirts and sandals in their Subarus. <laughs> Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all been there at least once? <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're running up the nearby hill to see if we can find an outcrop that represents something. And the engineer's like, where, where are they right. going again? Right, right. Look at my mud pit. Yeah. No, my, my favorite yeah. place to hang out is the mud trailer. I think, uh, I think the best photo of me uh, in my career, I was on a geologic field trip, which I recommend that all engineers do because... Every now and then it's good for us to go and look at the rocks. Right. But I'm standing about two meters behind, I'm Australian, so meters behind the rest of the group who are all crowded over looking at the outcrop. And I've got my back turned to them and I'm like staring up, looking at something else, just like totally, everyone's like, you were definitely paying attention during this whole week. I was like, I don't know, make some of it. Like, Well, that, that's another difference between geologists and engineers. Um, I need to see the rock. I need to see core or a minimum cuttings or something to actually touch that rock and see the rock. I want to see the color, the texture, how it's breaking. There's so many aspects to that sample of rock, whether it's in the outcrop or that you can actually pick up from, from, the, um, from the rig that I feel like you can't get a full picture of this just by logs and the other characteristics you're trying to map. Whereas engineers tell me if this is true, but I feel like you're happy with, that log with the, the character that's shown by digital data, whereas we have to see it in its environment to figure out, I mean, rocks in their natural habitat versus rocks in the lab. Um, that, that's so important. Yeah. Geophysicists anyway. are even worse than we are, though. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you go out in the field and they're dropping a hammer listening, like, did that? <laughs> so you know the joke, what is two plus two? Right? So the engineer says two plus two is 4.000. And the geologist says two plus two is, well, it's not exactly three, it's not exactly five. You know, it's, that's the range of likely values. And the geophysicist says, what do you want it to be? This is so well, unfair because we don't have a geophysicist that are here. Mad. But we do think, yeah, I mean, we do think really differently in how we like approach some of our problems and stuff. And it's, I, Rhonda, what are your thoughts on the, just seeing the logs versus actually going in and seeing the core and stuff like that? 
Um, I like to do both. I like to see the core. I, you know, I minored in geology, so <laughs> I do oh. have this streak of, you know, loving <laughs> to do a lot of that stuff. But um, the log is so much more important to me, uh, it, you know, on a different scale. The, the geologist is going to, to take the core data and the, the mud logging data and, and use it for different purposes, whereas I need the, the, the actual electric log. Because you can digitize a log. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't, but my text can, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think particularly for the younger engineers coming through, it's so important to go and look at the rocks every now and then. Okay, I laugh mm -hmm. about not paying attention. I was on a five day field trip, it was a long time. But I, I attended one of the AAPG field trips last year, no, two years ago, that, uh, out in Utah and stuff like that. I was the only engineer on it of a group of 25. Good on you. And the, um, the, the two guys leading it, I was chatting to one of them and they're both from the Utah Division of, of Geolo Geology, society people and he was like what are you looking for what are you seeing and stuff like that and it's for engineers it's about flow so we're looking for something even when we go on field trips to look at the rocks you guys are worried about volume right and as an engineer worried about what volume yep. volume volume yep and as an engineer we're worried about flow and they're both important and we you know so it's you know for the engineer I don't know if he agrees. Yeah, no, it's a definite important part of our education um, as an engineer to have that that look at the rock. So, so important. Do you guys think growing up you had more of an engineering or a geologic mindset? Did you tend more towards the creative or more towards the, um, the measurable, the, the quantitative? Just, I'm just curious, like, what, what you guys experienced in your, in your youth. I was sitting under the deck looking at rocks. Yeah, and I was taking things apart and putting them back together again and seeing how they worked. I was pulling wires and reattaching wires and taking apart radios and computers and so yeah. Yeah, and I was never good at math, but I loved hiking in the mountains through the outcrops. Mm -hmm. Deb, how about you? Yeah, oh, I was a Lego and blocks. Well, and Kat, that kind of leads to one of your questions around like the creativity part, um, you know, in terms of that creative outlet, Matt, you referred to it as well um, when you were talking about it right at the beginning of the podcast, the difference in the creativity between engin engineers and geologists and the, the way that we think about problems and stuff like that. So, you know, what are, you know, what do you see in the teams that you guys are either working in or leading in, in terms of that creative creativity piece? I think more creativity occurs when you have the diversity, the cognitive diversity in the team, you know, regardless of how creative an engineer can be or how much of a, you know, an imagination the geologist has, when you come together and you start shooting ideas across the table or showing them what you're, you've been working on and um, the geologist or the petrophysicists and, and such uh, might have an idea on that. I think, like I said, when you come together, that actually empowers the team to be more creative. I think the geologist forces the engineer to be open to the impossible. And the engineer forces the geologist to think hard about what can actually take, what can actually happen given all of the constraints that our physics or our um, management or our just plain, do we have the money to do that? Yeah. I have a, a follow-up to that. Um, in a time like this with low oil prices, so much of a focus on just trying to save money. Do you think that this is a time for creativity or is this a time to really just focus on the engineering and just get your numbers? What, what do you do during a downturn like this? I think both. You have to. Has to be both. What has happened in the last five years it has been not enough time being spent on that creativity side and knowing your rock. And, um, you know, when you listen to, I don't know if you guys have ever heard Trisha Curtis talk about the different basins uh, with Petro nerds and her big thing that she sees across all of her research is that you have to know your rock. 
um, the margins are thin when you're producing a lot of this stuff and drilling it. And um, we're not spending enough time on the science side and the creativity side. Uh, we've just been spending and drilling and that's going to have to shift now in order to be able to cut costs, be able to figure out how many wells do we need to actually be drilling in a, you know, a, a unit, a drilling spacing unit, how many, um, what, what kind of completions are we going to put in instead of saying, hey, this didn't work last time, we're going to try this next time without spending the time to actually study it. Before it was the time constraint, whereas now it's the cost constraint. I think part of it was a time constraint and the other part was we don't want to be behind. We want to keep drilling. Uh, we have to keep showing production because for some odd right. reason, we're not showing profit and we keep spending money. We have to stop cycle chasing. <laughs> yeah. I like that idea. You know, back, back when we just had the conventional mm -hmm. reservoirs, we had so much fun working in teams on, you know, trying to solve water flooding problems or, you know, where did our oil go and where are we going to drill this next well? You know, that was the fun part of reservoir engineering. And to a point, I'm not saying that happens all the time, but to a point, the unconventional business, we kind of lost that side of things because the resource is there. You're going to drill it. You're going to get it. So Matt and Rhonda, given where we are at the moment in the uh, fun that has been 2020, what do you see as like the next steps and the future for both engineers and geologists? within the oil and gas industry? You know, I think that uh, unconventionals would have been impossible without integration across the disciplines, all of the disciplines of geology and all of the disciplines of engineering. But now it's our challenge to respond to historically low oil prices or natural gas price and natural gas prices when two things are going on. It's the job of some geologists to propose risky, expensive new ventures. And it's the job of some engineers to slash costs wherever possible. Yeah, so I'm counting on Rhonda to have an answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I could think of is that we're being forced, we're being forced to switch gears and slow down and reevaluate operating costs, drilling costs, completion technology and uh, our rate of development versus, you know, seeing how when the entire world shuts down, how quickly our storage fills up. <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a pretty interesting uh, thing that probably needs to be studied, but um, yeah, is our, how, how, you know, we had this thought process of, wow, our demand is, you know, we have no problems here. We've got so much demand. But within the span of a month, that quickly goes away. So just, you know, reevaluating our, our rate of development. The comments down. that you've both said, I mean, do you think we're going to see a switch back to both conventional reservoirs and from development to exploration? Given, Rhonda, you were talking about, you know, when we used to look at water floods and Matt, you're talking about now's the time for that super creativity and the next big thing. Like, do you think we're going to see that? We're going to retreat to quality. Qualitative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the quality assets, both conventional and unconventional, I'm assuming. <laughs> sure, sure. There are both. There are both. Yeah. There are um, unattractive reservoirs in both categories. Yeah. And I think it's easier for the smaller operators to concentrate on, on those those old conventional reservoirs because the bigger bang for the buck is the unconventional for the larger operators. So while, while we're on the topic of the future, uh, the four of us each represent a different acronym within the Denver community. Um, how do you think we've all worked well together and where do you think we need to improve and where does that go in the future? So if we can each talk about our respective acronym and uh, how we work together and, and where it's going in the future. Matt, do you want to start? Sure. I think that uh, there are fewer and fewer of us uh, doing our jobs in across the different geoscience disciplines. And I think it's likely that you'll see the geologists and the geophysicists merge. And I think that's a positive thing. I'd be for it. 
And that's under RMAG, you mean, coming together as for- why, why do we need RMAG and DGS? Can't we have one society that looks at geoscience issues in the Rocky Mountain region, in the Denver community? Uh, we all work with each other, we know each other. Let's have one group and um, I think uh, that integration and that uh, sharing will be positive for both sides. Ultimately, does that result in a further merger? I don't know, maybe not, but uh, in the geoscience community, I like the idea. Would that be DWS and SEPM and DIPS and all those other ones? Or how, how do you see that playing out in the future? I like the idea with starting at the two crown level societies, geologists and geophysicists. I would love to encourage the petrophysicists to join and maybe we have an interest group for uh, international yeah. or other interest groups, but um, competing for scarce resources with your siblings is wrong. And also professionally, how do you ask your boss if you can go to three meetings a month, three lunches, each with a different society, because it's kind of relevant to what you're doing. That would, that would make that similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Show your boss that it makes sense. Rhonda, how about you at the SPAA? Um, as far as the society, SPAA stands for Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers. I don't think very many people know about our society. We work well with SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, always. Um, as, as engineers in general, we've, we've worked together, um, you know, to, to do work on the petroleum resources management system and some other things. Um, on a chapter level, in Denver, we have had functions, cross functions with uh, SIPES and some other societies. But I think the one thing I would like to see in the future are, uh, you know, when we have our chapter luncheons and, and the reason why we have the chapters because we're learning, it's all about uh, learning and expanding our horizons with our ideas and our growth, but having cross, cross function presentations, say having somebody from AAP, AAPG come in to SPAA and give a, a talk, a lunch talk on a topic and which would actually force them to put it into words that everybody can understand and uh, different types of communication or have an SPWE person go and give a talk at another society, you know, a geologic society on what we do and have to explain it in different terms that they can understand. I would like to see that. I think Matt's comment about the shared resources piece is hugely important. You know, we've got particularly even in Denver, where you know we're not a huge oil and gas community and we do all know each other fairly well, there is so much competition for resources, whether it's within our technical societies, RMAG, AAPG, SPE, SPAA, and all the other ones, or if it's through some of the non-technical stuff like Women's Energy Network and WOGER and the Young Professional Energy Group and all this kind of stuff. And right. for some of us, we could be members of like eight or nine different societies and it's, yeah. it becomes really challenging. And there's a huge amount that on, I like Rhonda's comment about the cross-discipline training as well, where we move outside of our societies, which Matt, to your point earlier, it's one of the reasons EarthTech has been successful, but we're not, you know, we could definitely do it more on a local level, but then how do we do some of these other, you know, what have traditionally been called soft skills, like leadership skills and, you know, helping out our communities generally that aren't necessarily technical things. You know, we're all facing similar things with the downturn and layoffs and, stuff like that as an energy industry and it'd be really cool to see the societies coming together on some of those topics as well instead of continuing to compete for resources and people and volunteers and, and all this kind of stuff so yeah volunteers are big volunteers is huge I mean you know yeah. we all volunteer. volunteer fatigue is a big problem mm -hmm. yeah and particularly yeah. in a small community like Denver so right and, and we're not a small community people. compared to Casper or Billings no. or Salt Lake exactly. Right. Kat, you had a good point there about sponsorship as well. Yeah, just how that fits in. Yeah. All right. Well, now that we've solved the world's issues in an hour, as usual, on the Crew.se podcast with Catherine Mills, 
like to thank Rhonda and Matt for being here and for Catherine for letting us take over. And until Woo! next week, give them hell. <laughs> I bet you guys weren't expecting that. Huge shout out to Matt, Rhonda, Deb, and Kat for Takeover Night. That was so fun. Thanks so much. And another special thank you to our uh, sponsors. That would be the Denver International Petroleum Society and Rare Petro. You can check them out online. They are excellent sources of information, uh, blog posts almost daily. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to leave us a comment below on this video or go on to Apple Podcasts and rate, review, subscribe. The more feedback we get, the better we can make the show. And of course, we always pre appreciate those five-star reviews. So again, thank you to everyone who was involved in Takeover Night for the Petroleum Underground. That was super fun. Until next week, give them hell and cheers. <laughs>